All right. Welcome. Come on in. There's still a few more seats left. If you haven't grabbed a beer from outside, I would suggest it. It's kind of nice. So this is Hold My Beer and Watch This, upgrading OpenStack from Havana to Juno. Uh, I am Jesse Keating, and that's my Twitter handle. Uh, I love complicated challenges. Uh, I've been doing OpenStack, OpenStack upgrades from around the Grizzly time period. And I have a very strong appreciation of dark, heavy beer since about the Grizzly period. <laughs> I promise I'm not an alcoholic. I can stop upgrading at OpenStack at any time. <laughs> and I do work for Blue Box Cloud. Uh, we're a fantastic company down in Seattle doing private hosted clouds as a, uh, hosted private clouds as a service. So let's talk about OpenStack upgrades. They're totally awesome, right? There'd be some dragons here, or whatever this thing is. Those of you that are laughing, now I know who the Reddit users are. But that's OK, because I have a plus five sword of Ansible to do all the things that I need to do. Uh, upgrade styles. Um, you can do micro upgrades. When I was at Rackspace, that's what we did. Rackspace was trailing master of all the OpenStack projects. Totally awesome. Um, and they would do micro upgrades every couple of weeks or every couple of months. Um, always an interesting challenge. Or you can do macro upgrades, where you're doing major release to major release to major release. Um, or you can do something even more awesome, where you skip a major release. Let's talk orchestration. Um, when you're doing upgrades of OpenStack, the eventual consistency model need not apply. <clears throat> OpenStack needs some very specific steps to be happening at specific times in order to make an upgrade <laughs> successful. Uh, this means that traditional tools like Puppet, where you make a setting and eventually your fleet is OK with that setting, isn't really going to work out for you. Um, so ordered set of actions you need to accomplish. But first, before we get to some OpenStack upgrades, let's talk about the database. So at Bluebox, we use Percona cluster. Uh, we have a two-node cluster with one arbiter that's sitting somewhere else to uh, do master elections. It was based on MySQL 5.5 in our current production model. However, MySQL 5.5 can't handle the Neutron migrations. So if I want to get to new Neutron, I have to first get to new MySQL, which is what that point is. I'm missing a step. Uh, I had a sheet, a web page here that showed all the steps of the, what the web page shows for doing a, a, my, a Percona upgrade. It's very long, it's very arduous, it's very ugly. It wasn't gonna work out for us, we needed to do something on our own. So we ansibleized all of it. We took our two DB hosts and our arbiter and we did a number of tasks across both of those. On the arbiter, we purged the old package and config we fixed the file system permissions because Arbiter left some awful stuff around, run the Arbiter role as if it was new, <clears throat> stop the database on the DB hosts, remove the packages, put the updated configuration in for the package, modify compatibility settings because the package will helpfully um, start up as soon as you install it, and if it starts up without having the compatibility setting, it'll destroy your database. Don't want that to happen. So we get the modified compat settings in, we turn off replication, we install the new package, which again, starts up the database. We run its own upgrade migration play that, that Percona ships, restore replication so they're able to talk again, and restart the database again. And then we repeat that on the other host. We're doing this one host at a time. Remove the compatibility settings, restart the database again, and then everything is copacetic. Uh, well, we, we turn that big, awful web page into a nice, readable, uh, Ansible playbook. Not positive if you can read that, but it's there. So this is running on the, D, the database servers. Uh, we are not tolerant of failure at all. And we're running this in serial, so one host at a time. Um, we're doing some checking to see if the, the MySQL version is what we wanted to, so we could run this play over and over and over again, and it won't eat our database the second time through. 
we are calling out a different playbook, and that's this playbook that does the things we want it to do. Stopping, removing, installing, compatibility, upgrade, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually we remove the compatibility settings, restart everything, and everything is golden. All right, so what about Rabbit? You know, if you're upgrading your database, if you're upgrading your OpenStack, you might want to update your Rabbit too, right? Don't. <laughs> Pulling Rabbit out, out from underneath OpenStack is a really bad idea, particularly in the Havana code base. Your services that talk over Rabbit will stop talking and not realize that Rabbit has gone away, and it'll sit there forever and ever and ever and ever, and nothing will ever work until you restart all the services. So we didn't want to have a bunch of service restarts in the middle of our upgrade. We wanted to try and minimize the downtime for our, for our customers. So just don't upgrade Rabbit. It's probably not a good idea. All right, on to OpenStack, because that's the fun part. There's a repeating pattern in upgrading of OpenStack. Um, you put your new code and config in place. You stop your old code. You migrate your database. You start your new code. That's, you know, it repeats service after service after service within OpenStack, and so that's something that we modeled into our, uh, our orchestration. The order in which you update your OpenStack services, it kind of matters, it kind of doesn't matter, but it matters if you care about your services staying up and interoperating as long as possible, which we did care somewhat about. I tried a few different orders. Um, this order that we're using works for us. It may work for you. It does attempt to minimize the disruption of the cloud as a whole by having each individual service down as short amount of time as possible. So all throughout, a few services here and there will be restarting as, as the upgrade happens, but the whole cloud operation as a whole tries to stay stable as much as possible. You're going to want to avoid inter-project version dependencies. So introducing a new functionality in, say, Nova that depends on a new functionality in Neutron, don't turn that on in your upgrade because you'll update Nova and it can't do the thing that you want to do because Neutron hasn't been upgraded yet. Lay down your new code first, get everything working, then start doing feature enablement when everything is on its new code. So our order is Glance, then Cinder, then Nova, then Neutron, then Swift, then Keystone, and then finally Horizon. Some shortcuts that worked really, really well for us. We had already done Neutron. We'd been on Neutron for quite a while, so we didn't have to do Nova Network to Neutron as part of this upgrade. That's a big shortcut. We, were, we did our ML2 migration. We went from OVS to ML2 as a different outage window. That one, the VMs did lose their network for a very short period of time, and then it came back. But we wanted to do that ahead of doing the OpenStack upgrade so that we're only moving three or four different parts, not 20 different parts at the same time. Linux bridge, that's right. Um, and newer kernel. Uh, we did our kernel upgrade for some of our customers as part of getting them onto ML2 and Linux bridge, so that was already taken care of. We don't have to consider that as part of our OpenStack upgrade. So those are just some of the shortcuts that we utilized so that we could do our upgrade without having customer VMs lose any sort of connectivity or lose any sort of uptime. Our strategy, we wanted to reuse our deployment code. Having separate code paths for upgrade versus deployment is a great way to have two problems. We wanted to delay the restarts of the service until the right time for that service, which if we were Go out later. <clears throat> we did want to fail immediately. We are not tolerant to any sort of failures in the upgrade process. So as soon as any failure is encountered, stop the bus. Everybody get off and figure out what's going on. But in order to do that, we want to have non-destructive reruns. So if I'm going to stop the bus in the middle of an upgrade process, I have to be able to restart that upgrade process from the beginning and have it not eat my world halfway through. But that meant we had to design each and every one of our tasks to be idempotent. We need to be able to run it again, or we need to be able to discover that it had already been run and not run it a second time through. All right, let's walk through some of our services. Let's talk about Glance. Glance has no real surprises. It's a pretty easy upgrade. Um, in our upgrade playbook, all we really do is run the Glance role. And we're passing in a few extra things into the glance role. 
we're saying that we don't want to, or we do want to force the synchronization of our database. So every upgrade, we have to synchronize the database. We put the code to do database upgrades directly in our deployment roles. However, however, we conditionalize them so that they only ever run if we're in an upgrade scenario. So all we have to do is run the existing Glance deployment role, tell it we want to force the synchronization of the database, uh, and we don't want to restart the service because of any config changes. We'll let the database synchronization code take care of that. And this is a little glance, a little <laughs> glance at what the, uh, the Glance deployment code, code looks like. So there's a, there's a step to lay down the Glance configuration files. There is a explicit call to stop the services before a database migration. So when database changed, which we are forcing it to be changed, uh, and for sync is true. Synchronize the database, just calling Glance manage with db sync. Uh, and we will restart the services. Um, although this notification to restart will not trigger because we do not want to restart, we have an explicit call at the end of the deployment that says, at the end of this, the service should be running. In a regular deployment, it'll have already restarted because we've flushed all of our notifications. And so in a regular deployment, this is a no-op. In an upgrade, this is where the service gets turned back on. Let's talk about Zender. Sender is a little bit more complicated because there are sender data and sender control. It's separated out a little bit more than Glance, which just has Glance and Glance registry. So we have a couple of different plays going on. We have plays that are targeted where sender is running on our volume hosts. In there, we're running the sender data deployment role, and we're just not restarting with services. But then we are explicitly stopping the sender volume service. Then we go through our controller and we run the controller role, and just like with Glance, we're forcing a synchronization of the database because the database lives on the controllers, and at the end of this role, the, the controller services are back up and running, and then after that, we can start our data services. Another bit more complicated thing is we are introducing Sender v2 with our upgrade, so we wanted to make sure we get that Keystone service added to the endpoint, so that's a little extra task that goes in our play. Our sender backend depends. Some of it is uh, dedicated NAS devices, and some of it is dedicated storage on a particular unit of our cloud, one of the, the machines of our cloud. Um, and then we are calling a new role, the stop services role. I don't like to repeat my code, so even though I'm going to do this for lots and lots of different services, I wrote a role that all it does is restart the service that I want to restart, so code reuse is awesome. Nova, the fun one. Although it's pretty straightforward. Much like Neutron, or I'm sorry, much like Cinder, there is Nova Compute versus Nova Control, so we have to do things in a two-stage approach run through the Nova data role, stop the services, run through the controller role, start up the services. That's all that's really needed there. Neutron. Neutron had a little interesting quirk when going from Havana to uh, anything newer than Havana. You need to stamp the database as part of the upgrade. Previous to, I believe, Icehouse, there were no Neutron database migrations, but there are now, so you have to give it a starting point. All that really means is, outside of our normal pattern of doing things on the various parts of Neutron, there is a point in which we need to first stamp the database with the, uh, sorry, once we check to make sure we haven't already stamped the database, because you don't want your database to go backwards in versions, we will stamp the database uh, with the new, with the old Havana version as a starting point. Then we can run our control role, which will, as part of it, we'll upgrade the database to the uh, Juno version. Then we can restart all of our services, uh, including all of our agents, and life is good. This is the only time in which some of the network connectivity might go down. However, it's very short, and most uh, consumers will just see this as a bit of a network blip or a small timeout. Things come right back on, and off you go. Swift. Really easy, the Swift guys have gotten their upgrades stuff down pat. All we really have to do is just run the roles as if we were installing, and off we go. Keystone, no sweat. Just run the role, and off you go. 
uh, but run it in a way that forces the database sync. And then Horizon, man, Horizon's just a web application. Why can't everything be this easy? Just run the role and you're done. No databases to worry about, no connections to, to worry about, just go. All right, so let's talk about some gotchas that, that can occur, because it all sounds really easy, but it's not entirely that easy. Uh, Keystone PKI tokens, that's a new feature that came in in, I believe, Icehouse. Um, thought it was gonna be really awesome. You could get rid of a callback to Keystone all the time by having the uh, validity of the token embedded in the certificate of the token. Um, turns out it's not actually faster, so you're not saving any time. Uh, but also, it breaks all of your services. As soon as you start Keystone, and Keystone's configured to do PKI tokens, all of your other tokens are now invalid, including the service tokens that all of your services are trying to use. So restart to Keystone, all your stuff stops. Not cool. Um, Neutron and Nova. So with, I believe, Icehouse, or certainly with Juno, when you're dealing with Neutron, you can tell Nova that you need to wait for Neutron to plug the virtual interface, and if it doesn't, it's fatal. This is a version dependency. If you turn this on in one side and you haven't upgraded the other, you might not be able to finish your instance booting. So it breaks the builds until both sides are upgraded. Now, there's a couple different things you could do. Uh, you can have a intermediate Nova config state that does not turn this on, in which case it will assume that if the call to Neutron was successful that the interface has come up, and eventually it will probably come up. Or you can just ignore this for the small period of time that both services won't be right, and that's what we did. Nova, Nova has a gotcha. Um, deleted instances in the database the data is still there. You go to delete an instance and all Nova does is just marks part of the table as deleted. Does not remove any data whatsoever. On a long running cloud, that can be a lot of data. The more data you have in the database, the longer your migration can be. And the longer your migrations are, uh, the longer the service is out because you can't have services running while you're migrating your database. There's also no supported tool to trim that data out of your database. So, you can either use a tool that you write yourself or collaborate with the OpenStack operators to find something that's been passed around and might work, or you just incur the downtime and know ahead of time that you're going to have it. What we've done is we've taken snapshots of our live customer databases. We've ran them on a test machine to see how long the migration would last. And in a lot of cases, because of the usage of our cloud, we've found that the time it takes to purge the database of the deleted data is roughly about the same amount of time it takes to migrate the database with its existing data in it, so we're not saving ourselves any time by doing anything other than just migrating it. Down the road, that may change, and the age and the use of your cloud is definitely going to, to have impact on this. So know ahead of time, before you try and do this, what your migration is gonna be like. So a few resources before we open up to questions. All of the code that you saw exists on GitHub under the Blue Box group Ursula Project. There is, it's a big pile of Ansible. There's an upgrade.yml in the root level. That is the upgrade playbook. It's making calls into our various roles and doing the various things that we need to do to stand up a Blue Box cloud. Uh, it's all open source. You're free to use it, free to laugh about it. Um, you can contact me if you have any questions about it. I live on IRC as well in the operators group. Uh, so now we'll have some questions, and while that's going, we'll just leave that on the board. So if you're gonna ask questions, I would ask that you use the mic so that the recording will pick it up, uh, otherwise I'll repeat it, and yeah. So my feeling is that everybody wants to ask about the order of the services. Mm -hmm. You started from the glance, and I, my feeling is that everybody wants to ask about this, so I'm the messenger. And uh, the surprising fact is actually you started from Glance mm -hmm. and then Cinder, why is that? So I started with Glance because it was a pretty innocuous service. Uh, there, there wasn't really any wild changes in the Glance API between, uh, well really none really, between Havana and Juno. So changing out this, the version of Glance isn't going to interrupt any of the other services. So that's just what I started with. It was, the, it was not quite the simplest service, but it's one that uh, 
tests our model and does it without having any interdependencies. So it doesn't mean that, for example, from Juno to Kilo, the order might be not necessarily exactly the same. It might not be necessarily exactly the same. It's that is just correct. just a matter of testing and making sure that. It is a matter of testing. And it does depend on your configuration as well, uh, which uh, features you turn on, how they're configured, where they live, that sort of thing. All right. Uh, so there was, in Paris, there was a talk about the Nova object versioning. Mm -hmm. Did you think about like a rolling upgrade without? Yeah, that? so that's something that I spent a lot of time working on when I was at Rackspace. And at Rackspace, it was super important because a Rackspace public cloud is a much, much bigger thing than a blue box private cloud. A Rackspace public cloud, one of their regions can typically have 6,000 compute nodes. And the amount of time it takes to ask 6,000 compute nodes to shut themselves down in order for you to start your migration is a considerable amount of time, particularly if you want to shut them down gracefully where you give any long-running uh, action like a migration or a resize a chance to finish up. So with, with that type of scenario, it's important that you be able to upgrade all of your other infrastructure, all of your other Nova infrastructure before you upgrade your compute infrastructure. So you, by using uh, Nova Conductor and by using object versioning, you can upgrade the Nova API, the Nova scheduler, the Nova everything, including Nova Conductor. Um, you shut all that stuff down. You leave computes running. They're no longer able to talk to the database because the conductor's down, but that's fine. They're still operating. They're doing any long-running tasks they need to do. Migrate your database, bring all those services back up. And now you have a version mismatch. You have new Nova control, old Nova compute. The use of the conductor saves all that because the conductor acts as a translator between those two barriers and so, it acts as a translator to the database. So I know that Red Hat, they claim that they support this kind of like a mismatch version just mm -hmm. for the upgrade time. Yeah. So, yeah. So once you're in that scenario, you can roll through your computes and slowly restart them as they gracefully shut down and come back up and they'll come up with a new code. Once everything's on the new code, then you can remove any object back rev that you're forcing and you'd be able to turn on any new compute features that depend on Nova Compute having that new code. So in, in a Rackspace model where your compute set is very, very, very large, that makes a lot of sense to focus on that. In our Blue Box clouds where our compute set is much, much, much smaller, the amount of time and effort to work through the orchestration to have all that set up is lost on just you know, going the other route of doing the restarts directly on it and getting everything up to the same level all at once. So by any chance, do you know, RC, which services support this object versioning right now, uh, so far? I believe with Kilo, it's just Nova. Just Nova. Uh, I take that. With Juno, it's just Nova. With Kilo, I thought one of the other services was picking up on that model. Um, there's a, what's that? Sender and Git both support. Yeah. So Cinder is one of the other ones that support it. Um, and with Kilo, there's a few other things that are making upgrades easier. Uh, Kilo was one of the last uh, migrations that you have to do that, that you have to stop the services in order to do the migrations. So some of the, the later upgrades, you'll be able to do a live migration of the database, and it will create all the new tables where the new data will live, but the new code will look for both places and slowly migrate them over time. So there's a lot of cool things coming with Kilo and with Liberty Beyond that's going to change the, the upgrade landscape quite a bit. Right, thanks. Great to talk. Thank you. So the size barrier between whether you would worry about doing uh, Nova Live up or doing Nova version mismatches. Um, it, if I had to guess, it depends. I'd say it highly depends on your orchestration tool. If it takes longer than a few minutes to shut down all of your compute, Nova compute processes. Now, shutting down Nova compute doesn't shut down the VMs. The VMs still run. Uh, all you're doing is shutting down your customer's ability to launch new instances or manipulate existing instances. If, that, if your orchestration takes longer than a few minutes, and if your SLA is smaller than a few minutes worth of outage for that, that's when you want to worry about trying to do uh, the separation of compute upgrade versus control upgrade. 
if your SLA is so large that you can incur that much downtime of the API level commands, then I wouldn't worry about it at all. Thanks. Yeah. I'm assuming you, uh, the, all these deployments are in HA. So if uh, like Nova is in highly available mode, like three nodes you're running. <laughs> if that's the case, uh, when you say you upgraded Glance, did you go upgrade Glance across all the three nodes? So HA on a service, on an API level service like Glance or the Nova API, it's a great story for uh, protecting against catastrophic failure where one of your nodes completely falls off the internet. It does not protect you against upgrades where you need to stop the services from writing to the database while you do a migration. So because of where Havana was and because of where Juno is, I had to do coordinated shutdowns of those services before migrating the database. So HA didn't buy us anything at that point. A uh, couple of small questions. Mm -hmm. So how big is your private cloud um, in terms of number of nodes, I suppose? And then how much prep time did you or a team of people like you put into well, the prep before you actually went ahead and did this? So our clouds, the smallest private cloud you can buy from Blue Box is three nodes. That's control and compute on two of those nodes and compute only on a third. So three compute nodes is the smallest you'll get from Blue Box, and then we scale up from there. Uh, we're certainly not at the 6,000 hypervisor level. We're much smaller than that. Um, I don't actually know what our largest set is. I'm not sure that I can say what our largest set is, but uh, they're, they're all reasonably small sized. Uh, our trick was that we have lots of them, and so we have to do this over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Uh, as for prep time, it's been, it, it took a number of development sprints in order to get the upgrade script playbook the way that we wanted it and proven to work and to write out the method of operation and uh, understand where it might fall over and how to restart it. So that took a month, maybe, of, of work on that. As far as prepping each site, that's a much smaller period of time. That's really just pulling down the Nova database from their latest backup, restoring it into a, a VM where I can test the stuff, figure out the time length, and that gives us a general idea of how long their upgrade process is gonna last. Then we just communicate with the customer, hey, we're gonna do this, you're gonna have API outage for X number of minutes, and at the end, you're gonna have all these new features. Awesome. And then would you, ha would you feel confident using these scripts again to go from Juno to Kilo? From Juno to Kilo, uh, I'd change a few things because you don't necessarily have to do, you don't have to do the database migration, you don't have, or the, the database upgrade. Uh, there are, you don't have to stamp Neutron's database. That said, those scripts will detect that scenario and not actually do those because you don't need to. Um, what I would do is look at whether or not I need to do a coordinated shutdown of the Nova service before I do any database migrations or anything like that. So I think I still have to do that to get from Juno to Kilo, so I'd leave it mostly as is. It's from Kilo to Liberty that things start to get a little bit interesting. Uh, our application also uses the Selemeter and the Debix, so I want to know, did you try to apply, uh, update these two services? The Selemeter service? And the Debix. Um, so we're not implementing Solometer in our private clouds, so I didn't have to worry about that. And what was the other service? Zabbix. This is also the uh, performance management. Yeah. There are many data in the database, so I worry about. Yeah, we, we don't implement that as well, so th that I didn't need to worry about. The, as far as the OpenStack services like, like Solometer, I believe it follows the same model, so that's how I'd approach it, of coordinated, get, get code and config in place, shut down service, migrate, bring up. Uh, but I would definitely look at their upgrade notes. Every release has uh, some pretty good release notes, and part of those release notes are upgrade concerns for each individual service. And that's where I got a lot of information from, not just from having done it for multiple years in, in the micro versions, but also between the major versions, figuring out what special things need to be done, which configuration options need to go away or come into play, or things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Could you go into more detail about the operating system upgrades and were those upgrades done to the cloud nodes or the uh, client? Ah, uh, so that's the dirty little secret. We didn't upgrade the operating system. Our operating system remained the same. What we've done is we package up all of the OpenStack services as Python virtual environments wrapped into a Debian or even to package. So all the, all the, the Python things that our, or the, our OpenStack applications need live inside that virtual environment. Uh, there are a few things that we need on the host level operating system, but we've either back revved the new versions of, say, libvirt uh, or Python libvirt or some of the other base level operating system things, we've either backported them into our own PPA or we're making use of, our operating system is Ubuntu, we're either making use of the Ubuntu Cloud Archive or we've, we've built what we need into our own PPA. So we don't, we're not tied to Ubuntu's packages of OpenStack, we do our own. And we do our own in a way that we can lay it down really independent of, of old versions so we can lay it down and run everything out of the virtual environment. So in the instance that you didn't do this preparation that you did, would the script still work? Or I'm sorry. Would it be heavily modified? What was that? In our, in our use case, we're, we did not do that. We have laid down an operating system, put OpenStack on it, mm -hmm. and in going to, from Havana to Juno, we need to upgrade the operating system. Right. So would, that, would the script still work with modification, or would it be a lost cause? They would work with modification. You would have to decide when you want to incur that operating system upgrade. Uh, my first guess would be doing the operating system upgrade first, if you can, and get your operating system up to the level that you want, and then lay down the new uh, package bits and get the services started. So if you lay down your new operating system, your old services are all going to stop upon reboot, you're going to start no new services. The VMs themselves may not even start up right, but if you can lay down your new packages in, a, in a, an efficient manner and get the new services started up, that's going to be cleaner than trying to do a split thing and trying to get new packages that don't belong on that old operating system in place before you upgrade the operating system. Mm -hmm. So my question was going to be about how much you might share with OSAD but your description of the way you do your packaging pretty much answered that question. Right, so OSAD is, a, is a, a, the OpenStack Ansible deployment, OSAD, OpenStack Ansible Deploy. It's a really neat project that came out of Rackspace Private Cloud, and they've put it up on SourceForge and then went through and deleted all of the Rackspace-isms from it, so it's now a generally useful thing. That happened fairly well after our Ursula project existed, and so there is a lot of duplication between the two, but also some differences in opinions and how things are done. Right now, we are not targeting using their stuff. However, we are collaborating with them, particularly on the upgrade things. They have an upgrade script which tries to that does a lot of this stuff. I haven't fully compared the two together, but there's a lot of room to collaborate, and I'm you know, pretty good friends with the guys that wrote it. So it's, it's all friendly stuff going on. So when moving from Havana to Juno, mm -hmm. with some services being Havana and some being Juno, mm -hmm. uh, or perhaps some services being half Juno and half Havana, what kind of experiences did you have around Rabbit and the RPC calls that were mismatched, and did you take any mitigation steps around that? So the rabbit problem only comes into play if you're running half of your services on one version, half your services on the other. So rabbit is only intra-service communication. We didn't do any of that because we didn't need any of the live upgrade type capability. The only way that you could do that really is with, uh, is with Nova, and that's if you're using Conductor, and we avoided that whole problem altogether. If you avoid that whole problem, then all you really have to worry about is the publicized, the public API in public APIs, as long as you are leaving your old one in place and only adding the new API endpoint and not deleting your old API endpoint, then your old clients, your old services are still able to use that new service and just make the old API calls. All right, well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, hopefully you know how to get a hold of me if you have any more questions and enjoy the show.